So hi everyone, welcome to another uh, episode of our masterclass series, our virtual masterclass series at the Art School at Old Church. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Tom and Maggie Yaschok here today. Uh, I believe teaching us or introducing us to their work and their processes uh, directly from um, Minnesota. If I got that right, Minnesota? Yep, that's uh, right. And they, I think everybody knows them well. Uh, they've shown all over the place. They've spent a lot of time at Tenland and at Archie Bray. And then I found out that you met at Archie Bray. So <laughs> that's a nice, uh, I don't know what you would call that, nice unexpected outcome of an artist yeah. residence. Um, and so let's just, uh, and Megan is going to be doing uh, the moderation as always. And I will be here all I don't think I'll, I will be here at the very end when we have questions because I have to go to a rehearsal not too far from here, but I need some lead time. I'll be here for the workshop. Thanks to everyone who supports the art school and thank you for uh, coming today. It's going to be great, I know. So I'll turn it over to you guys. And I'll, let's all mute our, our except for uh, Megan, let's mute our mics and uh, blacken our screens so that it's not distracting, okay? Is that all right with you folks? That's fine with us. That's the way we normally do it. So at the end, when we have questions, we can see everybody. All right, now let's see if I can model this. Uh, good, Did I, am I gone? So Pam, if you could turn your screen off, that would be great. Your camera. And then we have to resume record. Oh, we are recording. Good. All right, should we get started or? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, I think the format that we were gonna go with this morning is I will demonstrate how I make a altered oval picture. And then Maggie is going to jump in and uh, make a compound thrown vase. And then we'll both come back at the end and um, you guys can ask us any questions you'd like pertaining to what we did or not pertaining to what we did, I think. And, um, and we don't mind being interrupted um, with questions. So feel free to ask as we go. Um, Maggie and I are coming out of like our biggest deadline of the year. So we're kind of, uh, pottery isn't on our minds. So sometimes <laughs> interrupting us might actually help us. So gardening is on our minds right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a little bit of a, a jump back into our reality that um, hasn't been the case for this week. So anyways, that's where we're at. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for all of you for organizing this. We are both um, big, big lovers of the art school um, so and supporters. So yeah, thank you. It means a lot to us to be here. Um, also, please, we also, Sometimes we take for granted that everybody's at a certain level with making. So if there are terms that we use, please jump in and ask for us to define them sometimes if we gloss over something too quickly. So yeah, as Tom said, please interrupt us if you need to. But I know at the outset with when we discussed this, there was talk of, um, you know, some interest in us talking about how we work together as, you know, a couple. Um, so there, we will talk a little bit about that, about that at the end. Um, and also any larger questions you have about our studio practice or you know running it out of our home or things like that so anyways we'll leave it to tom we can get started all right so this screen will be my hand screen and then my phone will be um this one yep great it should be my microphone is just down on my computer so there's no like uh bad noise bad audio scramble um, I'm just going to check with everyone real quick. Everyone uh, can see the wheel, right? I'm hoping it should be pinned. If it's not, you can hit the three dots in the upper right uh, corner of your screen and hit um, pin, and it should pop up. So yeah, it says yes, it's good. All right, go ahead. All right, so this is uh, the finished version of the pot I'm about to make as wet clay. Um, so. Here we go. <laughs> um, I'm not going to do the throwing part um, just because of the racket that is throwing, but I just threw 
this pot this morning. So you can see it's just a round pot. Um, and, you know, to, to alter this, I'm just gonna squeeze it together. So I'm just gonna take this and push with my hands and push. You can see what's happening to the bottom. Do and you ever get any cracking with that, with, with manipulating it the way that you do? Uh, no, yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> there's like kind of a happy thickness where your this bottom does an accordion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, you can get S cracking um, later on in the process, but I think if you compress the bottom on the wheel and um, yeah, just kind of do this right away rather than later on. Mm -hmm. this, this pot's soaking wet. Um, so anyways, you can see how that round shape, um, like this this curve here and the, the overall shape of the pot becomes uh, accented quite a bit when you oval something. So there is a bit of foresight to this kind of altering that, you know, if I made this pot have the belly I actually want it to have and it'll end up having, um, it would it wouldn't work it would you know there would be problems right here or there might be problems right here where um the wall of the pot will sort of fold in or just can't handle the altering so anyways that's why there's kind of a gentle curve and the next step that i do to alter this is to kind of punctuate the hips of this pot it's a very like figurative pot um so i'm going to reach in here and just stretch that out and then turn and I'll stretch the other side out. And now you can see this altered back. Now this has a more um, punctuated hip um, or belly to the, to the pitcher. And that just kind of helps um, pull off the aesthetic of, of making a pot like this that um, instead of <clears throat> this kind of be sort of saying, does this have a, an angular belly? Now it's like has an exclamation mark that this is a very angular um, pot with the hips. Um, now I'm going to put the add the spout. So I'm just going to take a little bit of water on my hands and pull gently pull this up. How much clay would you say that you started with? How many pounds of clay? Eight pounds. Eight pounds. See how that's starting to change. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's better. Um, the reason to have two cameras is your sloppy hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somebody All asked right. how thick are the walls on that piece? Oh, they're like kind of a normal thrown pot thickness, like I don't, maybe like three eighths of an inch. Okay. Um, but I would like I'm not too terribly interested in like sort of wheel athleticism. So I don't um, throw terribly thin pots and I'll later you'll see that, you know, I just use a sure form and take the weight out where I want to and, and just kind of, you know, a lot of my throwing of pots is just about like a efficient way to get a wall. And then I spend a lot more time on trimming, which is what you'll see here in a minute. So I got that where I want it. And now I'm going to Take my thumbs and pull up right there. And then you can see how the spout's starting to get articulated. And I'm just going to use that articulation and work my finger, my index finger against my thumb. Now you can you can see how that has a more pronounced drop, and now a more pronounced uh, change in direction as far as you know the the rim uh, profile line goes. So that's where I would end this uh, wet stage, and then a pot like this, I often will put uh, this on a piece of sheetrock and then cover it with plastic to here.
Mm -hmm. um, and let it dry, dry like that, depending on if it's winter or summer, you know, it will take a little bit more or less um, finagling to get it, get it correct. How long is that drying time in the winter? I'd imagine it takes a long time. The winter it's quick, in the summer it's slow. Oh, because of the humidity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you, you can throw a cereal bowl in Minnesota in the winter in the morning, and you can trim it, trim it in the evening. Ah, uh, OK. I guess the heat's on also in the winter, right? So it probably dries everything real fast. Yep, we have a wood stove, so that's oh, nice. makes it dry, too. Doubles the, the dryness. All right. All right, so now we have the same pot, sort of. <laughs> but uh, this is leather hard, so like a soft leather hard, I can manipulate it a little bit. Um, and you can see uh, the bottom's oval. And this isn't as refined as I would like, so the next step I'm going to take is to sure form this down to sort of the more refined oval and more angularity I want in the form. Um, I'm going to tip this down just a touch. So I'm gonna, step one is I'm gonna change uh, the foot first. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I'm gonna change this just making this more oval. And when I alter pots like this, over time, I kind of figure out uh, what is the right order of operations so that one, you're putting less stress on the pot because you know a lot of times flipping pots up, upside down and all around, you can, start promoting like a rim crack and, um, and there's just ways to make make this kind of slow trimming uh, be more successful. So for this pot, it's foot first. And so now Now we have a more exact oval. Um, so the next step I'm going to do is define a foot. And I just use, this is like a Cheryl uh, mm -hmm. aluminum rib. And it's like a, a little bit thicker gauge than like your traditional like rib that might be like that. So it has, has a little bit more rigidity. And I just, I use this rim a lot to kind of trim or define pots. So I'm just taking this and making a foot. And do you find that the grog gets pulled out as you're using that? And what kind of grog is in the clay? What kind of clay are you using? Um, I'm using red, red like mid-range or earthenware clay. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, the the grog is definitely going to get brought out. I, I add brick grog to my clay. So, I mean, that's, you know, surface wise, my pots are all about that kind of moment of like a, a 1900s uh, press molded brick. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the kind of reference I am after. And it, you know, if, you know, basically a way to think about this is if I'm gonna put all this work into trimming most of my pots, I want to accent all that work, not hide it. So the brick grog um, really does that and gives my minimal pots like a first rugged material kind of layer. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's a big part of the aesthetics of my pot. So now you can see I have this foot ring defined. And so now I'm going to just take a loop tool and trim this just like you would on the wheel, but not on the wheel. Okay. 
just taking the circular part of a pair loop tool and digging out all the clay. And this is one of the funnest parts of making pots this way, I think. Is How did you come about this process? Just oh, trying to Yeah, yeah, a lot of just like an interest in altering pots and then, you know, trying to, you know, studying other pots. Like I think Michael Simon trims pots in a similar manner, or I assume he does. I've never seen him, but just looking at the pots and reading them. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just, you know, it's like when you look at a, a pot made on a treadle wheel, it has like a kind of slow, Fluid, fluidity to it and so you like capturing that moment and that's like a big part of um like minnesota pots mm. is that kind of like slow movement and um you know capturing that kind of moment so i didn't want to make pots that were just about somebody else's pots but sort of thinking about what i loved about those pots and then you know sort of making your own language and and this mm -hmm. is kind of what came out of that. Can you tell everyone what that kind of wheel is? I don't know if everyone caught that. Okay, a treadle wheel is like is uh, like what Bernard Leach used in England, and you know that's there's a big lineage in Minnesota of um, from Bernard Leach through Warren McKenzie, and it's just a a wheel that um, runs on a treadle. So there's a a lightweight flywheel. Um, I'll show you. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, let's see. But that's what a treadle wheel is, and you okay. can't see the, you can't see the wheel part. But this there's always that trapezoid pan that um, is where the wheel is. So it's just a you if you guys have locker B wheels or those kind of wheels, they have a heavy flywheel. And a treadle wheel has a light flywheel, which changes how the pots look. So now that I have um, this foot kind of roughly outlined, I'll take this rib and go back and clean up some of those uh, trim marks. And a lot of this kind of work is about like balancing how much handmade I leave in here in the pot and how much craftsmanship I kind of leave in the pot and balancing those two things. So there's a, a sort of beauty in the spontaneity, but then there's a, a moment of control so that. Um, Very fine that, line. <laughs> yeah, but there's, I mean, if you think of like, what people would probably call like a Japanese tea bowl or something like that. That's, you know, mostly spontaneity and, you know, slip cast pot is mostly right. control. And so, you know, I'm trying to be somewhere in that gradient. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that all cleaned up. You can see that I'm just going to clean the foot up. And then this is you know, in a finished pot, it'll look like that just to give you a different contrast. So now, like many of my pots, it's a, uh, a bunch of sure forming. So I want to see if I can put this down a bunch. So you can see how like this curve doesn't quite have, it's kind of sloppy. I want to tighten that up. So I'll just kind of pull out the profile line that I want with my sure form. And like I said before, an added benefit of this is I'm pulling out a little bit of weight. And for a pitcher, that's particularly a good thing because of the volume that this has to hold when you, when you potentially use it.
Do those little droppings ever drive you crazy? <laughs> they always drive me nuts. Well, they make very good reclaim. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's like a before lunch, there might be a, a massive mound of them. They're just sort of part of life. <laughs> yeah. So I need to flip this upside down just to get a get the bottom profile worked out. And how are these fired? Can you go over your firing process? Sure. Yeah, so I fire my work um, in a soda kiln to cone two, which is like a, you know, sort of strange mid-range cone that not many people use, but that's just kind of where I ended up um, from experimenting with soda firing earthenware and just finding where the, the best surface for me is. Um, so when this pot would be uh, leather hard or like hard leather hard I would dip it in slip too so that's a big part of and that's the next next layer besides the brick clay kind of appearance um, so this could use a little bit more sure forming but for the sake of demoing I'll leave it here you can kind of see how the profile is um, changing and you can see that from this way there's you know there was some slag here that I don't like. Um, and so the next step um, would be normally to let this stiffen up just a little bit more. And then I would come at it with the same rib and pull all these sure form marks out. So just basically combing over the whole pot. And I'll do this even to a pot I trim on the wheel, like a round pot I trim on the wheel. I'll pull out all of those kind of static trim marks and add this surface. Nothing for nothing else, just because I like this kind of scraped, um, sometimes even has like a little bit of a stucco. Kind Is of, it possible to get a close up just so everyone can see kind of the texture from the sheer yeah, form? Yeah, so I'm going to grab. I have a picture that's done. Okay. I'll grab that one for. So now you can see, you can see all the upward scrape marks and mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, there's a little bit of like balled up clay, maybe right in here. Mm -hmm. um, so all that will come through because I'm not glazing my work. I'm making slipware. So those kind of details, they all shine through for better or worse. So you need to really have a good handle on them. You know, if you're, you know, wood firing in an anagama kiln, soda firing, not using glaze, but slips or raw clay that I'm sure as many of you guys know, when you're not dipping your pots in full on glaze, those process marks, they become a lot more amplified than when you yeah. dip in glaze and that, uh, you know, thick layer sort of covers up some of that stuff. Um, again, for better or worse, depends on what you're after and how controlled you are in it. So this pot is ready for a uh, handle. So you know, it's the bottom's all refined, the profile's all set and it's um, yeah, ready to add a handle. So I'll just use a serrated rib like that. And I'm gonna just add a little water here to get the clay a little bit softer. And I know that the handle is gonna end up down here. So I'm gonna square that a little bit. And I'll set that aside because I'm gonna pull a handle for you all first. Um, I have you know, this handle that I pulled an hour ago, and I'll, that's the one I'm going to add. Um, for this kind of pot, it just helps to have a little bit more rigid of a handle than just a freshly pulled handle, which is what I mostly use on a lot of pots. But it's quite a long handle, so... 
You usually use a freshly pulled handle is what you said? Yeah, yeah, most of the time. I, I like how the appearance of that and um, yeah, it just, you know, that you can get a lot more like fluidity to a freshly pulled handle that you add. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's it just seems to be what works best. And, you know, in, in reality, you know, letting everything up sort of like letting all your processes sort of stiffen up a little bit or having that kind of babysitting, you know, that can really slow down your overall studio practice. So, yeah. you know, for me, there's kind of a practicality to that too. Yeah. So, water. So I just, you know, made this sort of tongue shape this morning and I'm going to just run my hand. Got it. So I'm, all I'm doing here is taking all the bumps and things out of it before I really start pulling. And then once the bumps are out, I'm going to pull basically with just my thumb is how I, I pull my handle. So I'm constantly moving my thumb, massaging out any of the imperfections of, you know, sort of, you're really making like a long volume of clay. And so that's what my thumb's doing. And I want a, just a slow taper to this, both in the profile this way and the profile this way. Mm -hmm. um, what so, time? Uh, she's not sure, but it's after one o'clock. Okay. <laughs> Did she sell the house yet for a million dollars? Uh, if anyone has their sound off, can you please, uh, if it's on, turn it off. Um, when you guys talk, we can hear you. So turn that off and turn your videos off, please, or your screens off. Thank you. Good luck on the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyways, you know, after this kind of touch I'm doing with my thumb is, is super light. It's just a, a process of, many many massages over you know many pulls rather than trying to get this in one go and so that's sort of where i'd end up and then i'd let this set up for you know half hour to an hour and then it can be added to the next picture do you find that most of your handles look the same despite the size or shape of your pot I find the handles are so particular and the way that people pull them, it just has to do with their, their hand shape. Do you find that? Uh, no, I, I think that you can get like, like it's easy to, like handles are one of those things that is super problematic to make because if you're like a wheel thrown potter mostly, think of all the reps you have wheel throwing. Mm -hmm. and then there's not nearly as many reps putting handles on pots because not that many pots need them. And so there's like a, I think once you find one, you can get a successful one, then you kind of hang on to that. And then you just change the proportion. Right. It's sort of what you're describing. Yeah. And so then Uh oh, we lost your sound. I lost your sound. I don't know. Did anyone else lose the sound? There we go. All right. I don't know why I did that on its own. <laughs> okay. So, you know, at some point, I realized that I, I had that problem of sort of just making the same solution fit all different pots, mm -hmm. uh, which, which works. But then, you know, I, I made a conscious decision to just sort of like retrain my hand to make different handles and think about them mm -hmm. in the same way that I'm thinking about pots. And um, I think a part of that is just like, it adds, it adds a good element of fun to, to, to sort of like break away from habits. Yeah, that's a good tip. So, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of my pots are sort of about design in a way. So what you're asking is, you know, I, if I'm going to design the pot, I should also design the handle. Right. And um, 
Yep. So now I, what I did is just do this to the handle and sort of give it a little bit of a, a leech head or something so that um, it has a little bit of built up clay because I know that I'm gonna have to smear that on there and I don't want it to thin out at the top. So now I'm adding that. And because of this angle, um, this handle kind of has to do a lot of morphing up here, at the very top of this pot. And that's a firm leather hard, right? The, yeah, the pot is like, I would say just exactly leather hard, not really, you know, my clay is a lot like porcelain, so um, I can't get away with adding a hard leather hard. Like, there's a lot of, like, technically adding stuff to pots has so much more to do with a pot already being shrunk than trying to figure out how to, like, correctly score and slip something. Mm -hmm. um, there's... The closer you can get to adding like wetness clay to each other, then they're going to shrink the same. And that's where cracking really comes from is it actually shrinking right. and scoring and slipping is just a way to, you know, meld two, two different wet clays to make them similar. So I don't even use slip on any, any pots. I just use water and, you know, add, add stuff when it's exactly the right moment to add stuff. All right, so I have that attached. And then the next step, uh, I'm gonna just kind of take out all those tortured marks by giving this one a, another one pull, one last pull. And now I'm just kind of sticking, sticking that on there down down at the bottom just to take some of the stress off of the top because this is a kind of a high stress handle because I want it to be a pretty pro pretty pronounced L. All right. And this is the handle that's been setting up for about an hour you said right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of like clay that you just took out of the bag. Right. So if you were trying to do this with something that you had just pulled, because you said that you like to use uh, freshly pulled handles, wouldn't you have an issue um, with that L shape? Would it be really difficult to get that? Yeah, yep. So like other handles, I'm not trying to do that. OK. Um, so if you like, you know, one, look at all of this negative space. Like I'm cantilevering this handle so far. So that's where, you know, I had to come up with a different resolution to, to get the handle I wanted. Um, so now I have, you know, sort of the, the ending defined. I'm just going to use my thumb and spread that out. And I want a pretty wide attachment because I'm going to match the shape of the handle. The handle slowly tapers down, just like the pot slowly tapers down like this. And then the bottom where it attaches is where it widens back out. So that's what I want in the handle, right? So there's a bit of unity to the shape of the handle this way versus the shape of the pitcher, right? Yeah, goes back to the overall design, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's like a big part of yeah. um, handle. You know how you design a handle has a lot to do with just mimicking the pot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to roll just a coil in my hand and add that to the inside so that it has a fatter aesthetic kind of attachment, which isn't functional in any way. Just aesthetics. Just the for this pot, I like, like this fat attachment. And I'm gonna take this pencil tool and just massage all that clay in.
And I dip this in water too, so it's not too sticky. And then I'm gonna take the flat part of a rib and come back and really make this handle sit so that as this comes up, it really matches that plane and it's just a continuation of a line. Mm -hmm. um, and that's basically how I, how I add a handle. There's a little bit more, you know, finessing things into shape, but I will spare you guys that. <laughs> just like the longevity of the sure forming. <laughs> um, but basically have that and for a you know a long handle like this getting the you know this taper all right when i pulled it is important because if there's any thin spot all this you know long negative space it's really going to accent you know if there's a thin spot in this handle that um it's going to be very sore sore on your eyes when you Mm -hmm. this pot um, in a shop or something. So that's about what it takes to finish a novel picture. Any questions before I pass uh, the stage on to Maggie? You guys can turn on your microphones um, and ask any questions if you want at this moment. Um, all right. Well, I'm gonna clean up the set here and uh, <laughs> and let Maggie have a, a clean. The handle look really beautiful. I just want to say uh, I think thinking about the negative space and and um, incorporating it into the angles of your of your pot or whatever you're making is a really good tip for our students here. Um, and just using that negative space, um, I think it's not thought about often. Um, so at least here where we are at the art school. Uh, so it's something you have to kind of slow down and think about. So thank you for your demo. No problem. Yeah, I think the, like one thing I didn't talk about too is like comfortability in the handle is often what you want initially. And, um, you know, achieving that's pretty easy of just having an, an interior that has a C curve to it. It has less to do with the, shape of a handle and more to do with just having a, a little bit of volume in the actual shape of the handle or the, the uh, cross section of it. You can just leave that. Well, Thanks, Tom. That was beautiful. Thank you. I have actually one more question just going back to making a handle. Um, is there any other way that you form handles other than pulling? Um, I don't, but there are lots of ways to do it. You know, the, you, know, you can use a coat hanger or loop tool like this to right. you know, change that. And then you just dig into a clay and that will make a pretty nice handle. Um, you know, a lot of people use like a printmaking roller like this and you can, you know, change as you give this a gradual tilt, you can roll and change a handle and things like that. But um, for myself, you know, I'm mostly, I guess I had a coil sort of lug handle to a, to a casserole mm, okay. that isn't pulled, you know, I'm just, just taking a coil and you know, using my thumb to massage it yeah. and change the shape. Yep. All right. Great, thank Maggie. you. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I am gonna walk you through the steps that I use to make a multi-part vase. Um, and it's a process that can be applied to, you know, in, in numerous ways. This is the way that I use it. Um, so looking at this, I have, this is thrown in three different parts. So there's a body, there's a foot, and then there's a neck attached to it. Um, this is another example. Um, and this one's thrown in four parts. So you've got a body, a foot, and then the neck is thrown in two parts. 
which, um, you know, maybe if, like Tom said, I'm not particularly interested in spending a lot of time in the wheel um, or in sort of doing magical feats. So I just sort of make things as simple as possible for myself. Um, so that would be in four parts. Um, you know, for me, I think maybe when I was starting, and I know you're probably all at very different stages in, um, in your abilities and your experience, but it, it may have seemed intimidating to me to make something sort of large and, you know, with lots of shapes. Um, basically with this, if you can throw a bowl, you can make a piece like this. Um, and in fact, when I was starting to make these, I did throw the body in two different pieces because I wanted to sort of play with different um, forms and sort of open myself up to that possibility of, you know, what the, the different possibilities. So basically it would just be throwing a bowl um, as quickly as possible on the wheel. Um, I don't spend any time finessing things or taking out lines or things like that because uh, like Tom, my process it is it happens mostly off the wheel. Um, I basically want to throw a rough form that I can later uh, sort of tease tease the actual form out of that. So um, if I were to do that, I would throw two different bowls really quickly, um, leaving a little bit of uh, uh, thickness around the rim so that I've got a surface for joining them. Flip them over on the wheel, trim that off as quickly as, you know, again, I spend probably less than a minute trimming this. Just get it centered. Just take, take the clay off. Um, and then I would join these two pieces together. Um, I like this. I mean, a serrated rib is a great tool for, uh, for scoring, but I found when I'm doing a lot of this hand building, I need something just a little bit more aggressive to keep those joins, um, to, to get, get those joins really strong. So I just score around the edge of both of these. And I think you'll find probably that I talk about a lot of the same processes. Um, it, in a lot of ways, even though our work is quite different, we do, Tom and I work a lot in the same, in the same way and are looking for some of the same uh, properties of play. I keep, you know, I've got a nice container of slip here. So just paint slip on. One side. Somebody asked if you both use the same clay. That a different uh, We don't. Um, I use like a true earthenware. Uh, so I fired a cone four. I was for a long time firing in gas kiln with reduction and sort of taking doing a similar thing um, almost to Tom, but without the soda. Uh, and since moving to Minnesota, I've just switched to electric kilns and electric firing. So I just fire a straight earthenware clay to about 04. Um, so once I've joined those together, I should have mentioned too that um, when you're throwing this, you would want to use. Um, can you grab? Um, Oh, sorry, never mind. Um, a pair of calipers just to make sure you have approximately the same um, width on your bowl. But once I've done that, I'll just sort of really kind of press that together. And then I just score and add a soft coil around the edge. And then I don't really worry too much about what it looks like. Again, the piece can be really rough. Um, but this will get you the same to the same place as um, what I actually I do throw these in one in one piece now um, and then I just leave an opening at the top which is where the neck will be added so with these ones once you get to the point of adding the neck you'll just put that on there draw around it and then cut that shape out to get that same hole um, but so that's a that's an easy way for to you know achieve sort of larger pieces um, if you don't have sort of the the long experience with wheel with wheel throwing um, so same same idea here I've got um, I've just sort of thrown this really rough piece, flipped it up on the wheel, trimmed off all of that extra clay. Again, I'm not worried. You can see there's lots of trim lines. I'm not worried about that at all. That whole surface will come off later in the process. And at this point, I'm going to add um, the foot onto the pot. Tom talked in when he was talking about his vase that, you know, there's sort of a long, you know, over time, you sort of figure out which processes and the order of what the best order for those processes is, um, you know, there's that can change from person to person. This is sort of how mine has naturally evolved. I'll put a foot on, um, let flip that over, let or let that set up, flip it over, and then add the the neck at a later time. When I'm throwing the feet, 
it's a lot like when um uh you know, when I first started pulling handles, when I was first making clay, you know, teachers always suggested, you know, make more than you need so that you can try them out and get the right piece, the right handle for the right piece. So I do the same thing with this. If I have four bodies thrown, I'll throw six to eight feet and I'll throw six to eight uh, necks so that I can um, mix and match and I make sure that I've got something that goes together and works really well for me. So as which far wheel as- do you throw on? Sorry. What's that? Which, which wheel do you throw on? I just use an electric wheel. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I've used both. I love, um, I love throwing on kick wheels. And I think if I had my, my druthers, I would do that, but I don't have a ton of space in my studio. Um, mm -hmm. I, my studio is a little bit, a little bit smaller. And I also, um, have it divided up into, I also have a drawing studio in it and a mixed media studio. So, oh, wow. um, so it, yeah, it's, it, it's really a size thing. Um, but uh, just looking at this, you can see that I've, that these are getting a little bit dry, but um, this is thrown on the wheel, just flat on the wheel, go right down to the wheel head and throw those, those forms. Um, so, and then all of that stuff will get cleaned up again later. <coughs> That's the same for throwing necks. I'll just put a piece of clay on, throw, push all the way down to the wheel head so that it opens up and then for, throw the, the form. So I'll have you know a, a number of those on hand so that between the different bodies that I have, I can find a, a match between all three pieces. Um, I did pick out a, a foot for this one so that I could save the time. Sometimes the process of matching feet and bodies and necks uh, can take me all morning um, to figure out what I actually like. So I tried to save you that, the pain of that. <laughs> so this is one I've thrown right down to the wheel head. Um, because of the curvature, sometimes I need to, to trim some of that stuff off, but on this, I, this one, it's sort of, you know, soft enough that I can kind of press that around. Um, I'm gonna get that approximately, you know, where I want it to go in the center. Um, score really well. Again, I use this. It gives me really deep ridges that um, just just for all the sort of joining that I'm doing, it makes sure that it's a nice stable stable join. I'm not shy about the slip that I'm using. Um, I, I really have found that uh, working quickly and rough, like quite roughly in the beginning works for me. And then I spend the time sort of through, throughout many different steps, I kind of refine each, each one. Add slip to that side. Um, Tom mentioned the balance between the handmade and sort of, you know, like balancing sort of moments of control with, with keeping a really handmade appearance to my pieces. So, um, you know, I think maybe a different person or even someone working in a different clay, like with porcelain, it might lend itself more to spending a lot more time, like making sure everything is exact. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an interest of mine. I want, I'm okay sometimes, you know, sometimes it, it doesn't work, but <coughs> excuse me, I'm generally okay if there's a little bit of irregularity um, or if things don't line up 100%. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with that and, and want that. Did that take you time to get to that place where you're comfortable with that? Um, yeah. I, well, I, yeah, I think so. Um, uh, I, I think it's just really a lot about in figuring out what processes you enjoy and what processes you, you don't enjoy and then minimizing the ones you don't enjoy. Uh, so th that I think does take time to realize what I truly, what I truly enjoyed. And um, I, I really don't enjoy sort of like buying fancy sort of like keeping things under control the whole way through. And um, it, 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 again, 
you need a moment of, of control in there. You need to know the, the, the viewer needs to trust that you know what you're doing. Um, yeah. so it is a fine balance. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, I think it has taken time to, to kind of learn what that balance is for me. But I am much happier sort of figuring that out and letting go. You know, I don't love, I don't love trimming. I don't, I don't love the wheel, I would say, you know, as the main process. Um, you know, I think it would be easy to talk about these as wheel thrown pieces because that's where they started. But the actual wheel throwing on this probably takes um, like, you know, five, six minutes total. Um, whereas the hand building aspect of it is quite, quite long and takes, you know, a few days generally to complete with drying in between. So, so I've, I've attached that on, um, I'm just scoring and then I'm adding a soft coil just to kind of smooth over that join and give it a little bit of extra strength. I like to keep, uh, a, uh, a chunk of fairly soft clay around just for this purpose, because then when I'm smearing in coils, I'm not altering the shape of the pot. I'm not, you know, having to press so hard to get it worked in uh, that I'm, you know, causing indentations or things like that. Mm -hmm. The pile of trimmings that you were asking about with Tom, um, that is a mainstay of sort of keeping like the right clay uh, around my studio. I, I love those. Any trimmings from the wheel, any trimmings from the sure form, you know, can get, you know, just dipped in water and become reconstituted into clay that you can wedge up in minutes. So um, that's really nice. So again, I've got this sort of rough addition. The other place I'm going to add a coil is just on the inside so that I can soften that join in there, soften that corner. I think both like in thinking about the wheel, Tom, both Tom and I think of the wheel as just sort of another tool. Um, I think when I was learning, it was sort of like, that's what you need to learn. That's what learning about making pots is learning how to throw. Um, and, uh, you know, I've really come to think of it as it's a tool like a sure form, like a slab roller, like any other, any other thing that we use in the studio. Um, it's a quick way, like Tom said, a, a very quick, efficient way of getting walls on a pot. Mm -hmm. So I think I, it's a really good thing to learn for new students as well, is it's a tool, it's not the end all be all, but it is a tool that's useful for you. Yeah, I mean, I know I, when I was learning, it was, it was all wheel. I mean, for three years, I just learned the wheel that's, you know, hand building, uh, I, I put that in, in quotes, but it, hand building was sort of like a byproduct, or you know, just sort of like a sort of aberration, almost. Like, <laughs> why would you do that? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I find it, um, it it very kind of meditative, and I think that it's a nice way of sort of keeping control over a pot in slow motion. Like sometimes when you're throwing, things are moving so fast um, that uh, it, it, it's harder to make decisions. Um, you don't have as much time to make decisions. So I've just added a coil on the inside just to soften and round the edges on the inside. And at this point, I'm just gonna let this set up until it's letter hard. Can I ask you guys how long it took you to set up all of this? I just want everyone to appreciate all the energy you guys put into it because I know how you <laughs> took a week to get all this together. Uh, yeah, well, for me, I mean, it, especially because things are sort of drying slowly, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like there's four different stages of, um, you know, throwing and then throwing the parts and then letting everything dry, putting, putting the pieces together, so. The, the best way to explain it is, uh, Zoom teaching is like a cooking show and yeah. regular workshops is, is not like that, you know, where you, you have to have a lasagna, not made, half made, 
Correct. Yeah, two steps sort yeah. of, <laughs> which makes in some ways makes the actual teaching a little bit easier because everything is sort of laid out for you and you just sort of fall into the right. into it. But um, um, so I've got this one is leather hard. I've added this foot and I'm going to just take the sure form um, and I'm going to clean up this part as much as I can. Um, the This is where sort of the I start to make more fast decisions um, about the actual form, like where curves are happening. Um, you know, if if there's a place that's not working, this is where I sort of need to take that clay off. It's also the first stage in taking weight off. Um, when I throw these, I'm not worried about too much about the thickness. I actually want to have a little bit more thickness so that I can, I have room to um, make decisions later. Um, if I'm throwing something, if this is already sort of really thin, um, then I'm not going to be able to change the form and, and pull out what I actually want. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember I have this very clear memory of my instructor when I was first learning to throw of my teacher, um, throwing a little pitcher and then watching him trim it. Uh, and he trimmed it right side up. Uh, so, you know, he was just sort of using it on the wheel and and it was just this really magical, beautiful moment of watching, like it was like a little bird stepping out of something. I, it was just this beautiful moment of watching this form reveal from reveal itself inside, um, inside this sort of like messier chunk of clay. Right. And I, I think that I, I think about this process sort of in that way. Um, it sort of as a slow a slow reveal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm. First off, getting making sure that this curve and this spot in here is what I want it to be. And then also working up the body of the pot, trying to take off some of this clay, because right now I have um, sort of gravity working with me in that I, I can have this upside down and I can press as hard as I can on the pot without, um, without cracking it or changing it. Um, yeah. Once the, the neck is on, then that, all of that becomes a little bit more problematic. So, And when you uh, do you glaze these ones, I know um, Tom said he uses slip. How do you um, finish these? So I use slip as well. Um, I do use a red clay, but everything pretty much turns out white. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I always get a <coughs> cough when I have to talk too much, <laughs> which shows how quiet my life is normally. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I will um, paint a white slip on. I use a paintbrush rather than pouring. And then I, <coughs> um, and then I bisque them like that. And then I'll go back with a, I usually use a white underglaze as well, a layer of white underglaze over top, and then layer a slip or a, a glaze over top of that. And it, for these, it sort of depends on the pieces that I'm doing, but for these, because they're not like, they're not as strictly functional as say a mug, they don't have quite the same requirements for, for, um, having, you know, like glazes that don't stain or, or things like that. So I use, it's like a, a satin or kind of a satiny matte base glaze. It's just a clear that I paint on over top so that there are, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty subtle surface. I think maybe if, if it's, it's a little easier to understand in person, <laughs> but it will, it, you know, because it's painted, it's got sort of layers of, of slip or underglaze or glaze. Um, so it's not a uniform shiny or matte surface. Um, so once I've got that done, before I flip it over and leave it to the next step, I'm going to clean up this part as much as I can, because again, it's much easier to do right now when it's flipped over and I can kind of really press down on it as I need to. So I've got my serrated rib and I'm just going back over it, much like Tom was doing with his rib um to take out all those sure form marks um it's sort of like using different grades of sandpaper like the sure form is like a 60 grit and then 
this comes through at 120 and then I'll go back with a smooth rib and that'll be my 320 uh, grit sandpaper. So um, this is sort of the next, the next layer. And I like to do it at this stage for the bottom of the pot, just because it's so much easier than having to flip it over again and work on it sideways once the neck is on. So if I can at least get that weight off and get this surface sort of in place halfway up the pot, that's sort of what I'm, I'm looking for. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your slip? Like what's in it? Do you guys buy it? Is it commercial made? Is it something you make? Um, it is something we make. Um, I know we both have a couple different slips that we use. Um, we do make it. And I, I think for both of us, it's been just a process of trial and error, figuring out what, um, what slips we like or what qualities we want in a slip. Like Tom's, it's really important for Tom that they're, that they react in a soda firing. Um, what's that? There, it, Tom ball mills his, which means uh, you put it in a jar with a bunch of little porcelain balls and they turn constantly and that breaks the particles down so that it's a little bit finer, um, closer. If any of you know what terracid is, it's closer to a terracid sort of um, surface. I don't do that, but um, I, I mean, mostly I'm looking for, for whiteness in mine. Uh, one other quality that's nice is that um, if, if you can add that to a bisque pot, that's a really nice quality because for both Tom and I, for some of our larger pieces, uh, it's, it's problematic to try and slip them in greenware because they're so large, they're, it can cause cracking. So if you can bisque it first and then apply the slip, um, that's really helpful. So that's something we look for in some of them. Um, a few of mine, I want sort of like an interesting surface because my pots, they are just electric fired. So I'm not adding any qualities through the firing. So I would like it to, like, I love it uh, for, for pots, for slips that I'm using on the surface, if there can be a little bit of um, pinholing or something like that, which adds a little bit of interest to, into the slip. Mm. Um, uh, paintability, like, you know, if I can paint with it, some mm -hmm. slips are more work better with that. So you find that a cracking is an issue with you guys on a regular basis or no? Uh, well, we both have certain pieces that it's a problem in. Mm. Uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine with mugs and, you know, smaller things like that, but, um, the larger things or things with joins or things with really fine rims, um, it can be, it can be more of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got that. I'm going to flip it up now. And at this point, I'm going to add my, the neck of my vase. Um, and I, I want to make sure again, that it's, it's, you know, relatively centered. I'm not looking for, uh, for perfection ever, but, um, uh, so I've drawn that circle and then I'm just going to cut leaving, you know, half an inch or three eighths of an inch overlap for the for the neck to sit. And this is a really nice stage uh, of leather hard. It's it's holding its shape. Um, I don't have to worry about um, it sort of collapsing or anything like that, but it is definitely um, still soft enough to take an attachment and things like that. So you can see I've left an overlap. I'm gonna go through, score around the edge. And score around the edge of this. Lots of nice goopy slip. Um, a quick time check. It's um, almost twelve ten, so we have about twenty minutes or so. Yes, I just saw that, okay. so I'm gonna, gonna sort of step things up a little bit. At this point, I've got this joint on. I'm gonna go ahead, score, add a soft coil around the neck of the piece, just like I did on the foot. I'll add a soft coil. Then I'm gonna let that set up again until those until that joint is leather hard. 
And then I'm going to come through. I've already cleaned up most of the bottom on this. So I'm going to come through and clean up the neck on, on this one. And, and again, get those curves in place. Um, make sure that I've taken away all of the extra weight. Uh, because I can't get my hands inside to feel the weight, I really have to rely on the feel of it. Um, and these have like a, a melon quality to them. Or like, you know, if any of you have children, like the head of, you know, your, your kid's head, um, it's just, you know, they're sort of like a, both strong and sort of fragile. And so I, I have a pretty good sense through just picking it up if I've got clay off in the right spots and, and got enough of it off. On this one, I've also added in, this is where I can kind of go in and add in a line if I want. Um, so this like more formal change in direction. And I'm gonna just take off all of the clay that I, I want. I know there's a lot of extra clay in this neck, so I wanna thin that down a little bit. And I'm not going to take you through this whole process because like Tom said, it's, you know, it, there's a lot more sort of fussing around I'll do here just to get that form exactly what I want. And then I'll go through again with my serrated rib and fill, cover the whole surface. So then at this point, the whole pot is leather hard. Um, everything, all the lines are in position, all the clay that I'm taking off has been taken off. Um, and the whole thing will be scraped down and like combed with that sort of um, serrated, serrated surface. And then I'll come in and do the final cleanup. So I've let that one set up, um, you know, let it dry for, you know, sometimes it, it depends what season it is, but you know, half a day or so of sitting out should is usually enough. So it, can you guys see that surface? So it's all got that combed surface. Then I'm going to come in with just my plain rib and I'm going to clean that surface up. I'm going to take out all of the, that combed surface. So um, I do generally add grog to my clay. So this is a moment where, you know, all of those little bits of grog will get dragged and, um, you know, any sort of throwing lines or trimming lines, things like that, that are still showing through, will get taken out. Um, this one, I can definitely let go a little bit longer than leather hard, just because I'm not, I'm not, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not changing anything at this point. And it's helpful to have the clay on a little bit of a little bit drier because then it's just scraping off the top of the, the little comb marks rather than pushing that clay back into the clay mm -hmm. and sort of smearing it. So pretty much for all of these, there's like a right sort of dryness at which to do all of all of these steps, which again, like you know, has has taken time to figure out what what works and Now I'm just going to work on the top part of this because I do want to leave enough time for, um, you know, questions, things like that. But I'll just show you sort of like the final steps for the top part of the piece. And these were ones that, you know, when I was first making them, um, you know, in regards to the slip, I would slip the inside of them, um, you know, let it set for a bit. And then I would, I was pouring slip and I would slip the outside of them and it was just too much for the pots. And so I lost a lot of them just by the weight of that wet slip going on them. Yeah. So I kind of changed the process and now I paint the slip on the outside because um, that's when I find the slip sort of it does what I want it to do. And then I bisque them. And then when they come out of the bisque, I will add a, I will pour a, a thinner slip onto the inside hmm. um, where it doesn't matter sort of, I, I'm not looking for particular surface qualities. Um, so once I've done that, I'm gonna come through with a sponge and make sure I've kind of taken out all of those, um, all all of the lines that I don't want. 
Um, another tool I use a lot of are these little green scrubbies. Mm -hmm. I love these. Um, they're a really nice way for um, to, to take out like funny little ridges. Um, they're great for cleaning up the bottoms. Like if I'm trying to get this in the round and it's just not quite in the round, these are really great. Um, the, they take, they can be kind of aggressive, um, but then there's a limit to how aggressive they can be just because, you know, they're, they're only going to access an eighth of an inch or even less a 16th of an inch. So it's great for sort of, um, making a nice smooth sort of eroded line on edges and things. Um, so once I've got that done, I'll, and I will do it over the whole pot, I'll lie it down on a piece of foam and clean up the bottom as well. But for time's sake, um, then I'll come through with this red, this red one. And that's, this is sort of the, the last step is just smoothing. And this gives it almost like a burnished sort of sheen, but it really just sort of, it makes it clear to me, first of all, it, if there are any sort of spots that need attention, um, I don't know if, the, if that's clear to see on. Um, you can see the sheen, yeah. Yeah, but, and then that's, that's it. So at this point, I'll let them dry. Um, uh, most of the way I'll let them, I'll let them dry to almost, almost bone dry. And then I will paint layers of slip on in a few layers. Awesome. Um, and then that's, yeah, that's it for, for vases. Um, do you find that, um, that process you did just did with the sanding and the scraping back, you do a lot more when you're under stress. It's almost like a meditative thing. <laughs> well, it's, you know, like Tom said, he does that even on, on any pot that he throws on the wheel. I do that with mugs, with everything. everything uh, and I do, I love that, that sort of, um, I love going like a little too far and then you get to take the surface back and back and back to what you mm -hmm. want. Um, so that, uh, you're, you know, you're, you're sort of giving yourself all the possibilities. Um, and then you get to choose which ones you actually like rather than, you know, if you throw it thin right off the bat, then you, you, you don't have that surface to play with. So, right. but yes, it is, it is, it's always, it's the most satisfying part of like, you know, finally, you know, I, just taking it from something like this sort of Frankenstein thing with these horrible coils everywhere. And then um, taking it to this quiet sort of sheen. So thanks. Okay. Um, I can invite everyone to turn on their videos and turn on their sound. And if you um, have any questions, um, I was going to actually ask, can we see your studio? Can we, can you give us a tour? Is that possible? Yeah. Sure. I don't think we, you need both of us. So I'll take you and bring you back to Maggie when, while she's cleaning. Okay. So this is the outside. We gotta turn it around. We can see you, but we can't see the outside. Um, I'm walking away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's like a barn style. Like a barn. Okay. Yep. There's our house. <laughs> Great. That's a nice property. Wow. Yep, we have five acres and a 1800s farmhouse, despite the ugly plastic siding. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, then this is my studio, which was a two car garage, um, which is where we're demoing today. Okay. There's our heater, which today is actually cold enough to have the wood stove going, unfortunately. You guys cut your own wood you get the pellets or we get slab wood so like the the edges of a mill so i don't have to split but i just cut to length so okay. and then we have um two electric kilns and this is kind of since it's a bar barn the you know the bottom is twice as big as the top part the loft and so this is sort of our communal space so we have um a glaze lab and then we have a gallery do you guys create all your own glazes i'm assuming so but um yeah i mean i only use like a sort of 
fake myolica. Okay. And uh, Maggie uses a probably a couple more glazes and you know like commercial clear as well. So then. Yeah, we, we make them, but uh, I don't make the we're not like glaze chemist kind of potters. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of testing that goes into firing to cone two in a soda kiln. And um, I think Maggie switched around enough. She's done a fair amount of testing, just, you know, grabbing other people's glazes and, and um, yeah, grabbing existing recipes. So, anyways, then there's a loft. So this is Maggie's space. Um, so yeah, this all we're lucky. And so Maggie does mixed media, so she has, you know, uh, this side for that, and then this side for making pottery. So. Which is messy right now. <laughs> Sorry, I did this all off my computer, so it's not as a. Uh, accurate shooting of the camera but so yeah that's uh that's our studio you guys have a good amount of space for each other it's nice you have uh two different levels too it's essential yeah <laughs> i'd imagine so <laughs> well, yeah. when when the workshop was proposed to us i think like marilyn and had thought maybe we would talk a little bit about working as you know what it's like to work with two of us and mm. um just w in regards to that you know we spent three years working together at penland sharing the same studio and um i think the main takeaway from that was that we need our own studios yeah. <laughs> you know we just we both have very different um working styles and you know tom is very sort of slow and steady and i'm sort of like i i i have that but i also have like sort of an explosive excite excited side where you yeah. know um i can be working on you know moving back and forth between like mixed media or you know and clay and um maybe not always uh be as sort of like organized or things like mm -hmm. that so that was one main takeaway um but I did want to just say, like, with, with regards to that, I mean, you know, Tom and I, as, as far as working as a couple, um, I know they'd mentioned Bandana had done a, a talk and, you know, they really collaborate and work together on, on a, a single body of work, which we, we don't do. Um, but there is a lot of overlap in our thinking and in our techniques. And I think that that sort of, it's not even, it's not even an obvious thing. I think maybe there's been an evolution within both of us of like, you know, sort of picking up on processes or tools or things like that. Um, even though our end goal is maybe not quite, that we don't have quite the same vision mm -hmm. for where we're going with it. But um, there is definitely sort of like an under, under current of like borrowing ideas or, you know, yeah. um, or maybe even a simultaneity of, of ideas where I'll, be thinking about making something and I'll, I'll come down to the studio and Tom's made that thing that day or something. Um, oh, wow. or it's just like a, a funny sort of coincidence of, you know, the things we talk about or look at or something that we see when we're together. That we're both of... riffing on still life right now. And we've never yeah. talked about that. Our work going that way. It just sort of like, we're both, you know, fell on the same path, but you know, it's a different riff, but it is, you know, there's pairs in both of our work right now or something like that so uh, okay. okay just uh, funny here's the fruit <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah funny, a funny coincidence you know like i'm getting a lot of influence from my mixed media work which then feeds into um you know the the clay or vice versa um things like that so um yeah it, i mean there is sort of a funny collaboration that's that's not intentional um which i think i think we're both pretty comfortable with um i mean i don't um, I don't think it's not plagiarism if you're married. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna quote you on that. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> There's the man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just having this conversation with uh, Karen, who's on here, about our studio and just working in um, a community studio, and a lot of things get shared like that. Oh, um, yeah. Just the it's just what happens when you're with somebody or a group of people. Um, it's almost like human nature to. Yeah. Um, share these things in a way it's like how we've evolved as humans so yeah. yeah yeah and I think like both of us trust in our own process enough that we can be with that and then you know we trust that it's sort of going in our own direction and um even if even if it's just a stopping point that we share like I think it, it will sort of go off but 
I think it is a really nice, for, for me, it's a really nice side effect of working beside, you know, or close to Tom, so. Yeah, yeah, nice. It's like if there's a, a tidal wave, it can get twice as big and just get to the place where it needs to go faster. Yeah. yeah. So. Makes sense, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Got a quiet. <laughs> Everyone's still muted. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it on. Um, do you guys find your your child uh, inspires you? I don't know. You have a five year old, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's he. I, maybe not with clay, but he definitely does with um, drawing. Like I have a whole shelf of sculptures up in my studio that are his, where he'll take like the pieces that I have in the studio and just sit down and like I want to do this, and like you know we sit and hammer something together. And mm -hmm. I mean they're ridiculous. Right. I mean, it's ridiculous how easy it is for him just to be yeah. like, um, you know, this is this is my piece, and um, drawing is really, really ins inspiring for me and really fun to see. So, yeah. but yeah, maybe not so much in clay. I think it probably just changes like your patience and things like that. That you know, it, there's he's five, so he's just about to enter school. Mm -hmm. um, so for the last five years, you know, all of nobody gets their own time it's all sort of like um you know he, he basically chooses whose studio he's in every day and so, so for one month it might be maggie and then the next month he might be me and that's sort of how it goes but it's, you never know you can't count on it <laughs> so. yeah yep. i fully but, understand that i have a five-year-old as well so yeah <laughs> i get it for sure have you found that it's a lot uh harder to work uh, with a child just having a child in your oh, life yeah <laughs> I think maybe it's less hard for Tom. I'm I'm an adventure. Um, mm -hmm. I think he's easier. He has an easier time separating sort of Hamish's needs from his own. Mm -hmm. uh, but I and and maybe that's just you know having nursed with him and you mm -hmm. know just have a different relationship. Um, you, you know, I really was for the first few years like the primary caregiver. I think so. Yeah. I it's harder for me to separate myself from him in that way so yeah. i think it's been a little easier but it gets easier every you know he, he every works year. two different ways in our studio too my maggie studio has a couch and like he gets that in between space that's sort of his and if he works in my studio he's just standing on the work table that we're talking from right now and uh -huh. so you know we're sort of eye to eye yeah it's right in the middle of it and so there's there's sometimes where it just isn't going to work that you right. can't be in my space because I need all the table or whatever. But um, right. audiobooks, a lot of audiobooks. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Sounds like somebody needs their own little studio. Wall off part of your studio. He's talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> like when I have my own studio or whatever. <laughs> like today is our day off normally. And so they sometimes we're like, it's it's family day. Like, what do you want to do? Like, should we go for a hike? And he'll say, Let's go, Let's to, the go to the studio. <laughs> no. like, <laughs> <laughs> they met for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, um, you guys are are you coming to the show? You are, right? The I am, yeah. I your show. Yeah, I, I thought I saw your name on there. Yeah. Um well will he be coming too? Or will your child be coming too? Is the family coming? No. I don't think so. I there there was a time when we may have done that but it's a pretty long you know from north carolina it might have been easier but from here it's it's a pretty long trip so yeah it's a, it's a tight show to have a kid in yeah that yes. too I it's agree. just yeah it's not that that fun for the other parent so no yeah, yeah. i wish yeah <laughs> well thank you for um being here on your day off i feel a little bit bad now <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no. Okay. That was what I was saying. No, that wasn't what he was been saying at all. Any day can be our day off. Yeah. We're half retired. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you for being here and I look forward to seeing you at the pottery show. And um just one last shout out. Does anyone have any questions? Let's see. Let me check. No, it looks like no. Um okay. All well, right. Thanks all so much. Yeah, hopefully you there's some things you can take back and apply in your own studio. So yeah, definitely. I got inspired to go try uh, a couple of things that you said. So, and I'm going to get on my sheer form a lot more.
<laughs> I use that once in a while, but you've you've kind of inspired me to sort of push a little bit more with that. So oh yeah, it's the it's the basis of both of us our practice. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were, yeah. yeah, fear the day when they won't sell them anymore. But no, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> you have to make your own. Yeah. You go. All right. Well, thank all you right. all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. That was really interesting. Great experience. Great. Great. Talk to you soon. Bye. Happy Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.